What's the best part of Monday? It's time for Ask the Captain. All right, let's jump into our first question. Barry1903. I was headed back to the airport. Visually, visuals disintegrated and spatial orientation kicked in. I thought I was on my side and started to correct, but instruments showed straight and level. It was the scariest feeling ever. Yeah, that is the scariest feeling ever. Uh, you get a little bit of vertigo and it has to do with your inner ear. There's like these little spaghetti things that stand straight up in your inner ear that tell you you're straight up or you're laying down. And when you get into an airplane, when you're doing this in three dimensions, by the way, all right, and you maybe got a little bit of congestion in your head or in your ear, and those things get stuck, you can believe that you're turning to the right or you're turning to the left when you're actually going straight and level. So one of the things they train every young pilot on is to believe your instruments, especially if you get into the clouds and you have no visual references. So you look at that and he said, I looked and it said straight and level and it's everything you can do to hold straight and level because your body says, no, 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 I'm turning to the right. I need to, to correct to the left. Don't do that. So what you did was right. It is a scary feeling. I've been there a couple of times uh, in my career and a couple of times in the military in, during training, they tried to induce that um, so that you knew what that, that feeling was like. So valuable training, but you did the right thing. Good job. Okay, we got uh, Jim Jam SC. I pinched my nose to clear my ears. That's called Valsalva, by the way. One side stayed plugged. Instantly, my head was like a balloon, feeling like I was uh, turning hard right. That's what I just described to you. Training kicked in, and I didn't touch anything. That gave me a real scare. Again, it would. Uh, and if you've got an autopilot on your airplane, that's your best friend in a situation like this. If it's not already engaged, engage the autopilot, because the autopilot will level out the wings, and then you can sit there and try to clear your ear out or whatever. You know, If you've got some that the nasal spray, Afrin, that'll open you up a little bit. I always carry it with me uh, on the airplane. But yeah, that'll get your attention uh, when you get that. Every once in a while, over the years, maybe three times in flying airplanes for 40 years, you start climbing out, and as the airplane begins to pressurize, you don't maybe know that you have a cold or you don't realize that you've got some pressure in your ear, but your ear begins to block a little bit, and and we're climbing out, and all of a sudden, you're kind of looking, and the instruments start to, to dance around in front of you. Uh, what I've done is said to the, my other pilot, hey, you've got the aircraft right now. Try to clear my ears out a little bit. If I got that afferent, open myself up, and it all goes away. But, uh, yeah, it's very scary when that happens. All right. Uh, spine wrenched 848 writes when pilots get so disoriented do they stop trusting their gauges or maybe they just freak out and stop looking at them well i hope you don't fly with a pilot that just freaks out okay one of the things that is important about our training is it it kind of works the freak out gene uh out of you now do you trust your instruments or not well that's the whole drill is you're, you're hammered over and over and over again. If you get that disoriented feeling, trust your instruments, trust your instruments, look at them, stare at them, and make sure you get that airplane wings level or climbing or descending the way you want it to be, not according to what your ear. It's very insidious. It really is, it wants to convince you that you need to do something else, but that instrument will never, ever lie to you. See, my young pilots out there, the instruments never lie. Your ear does. Okay, got that one? All right, great question. Leo Tiki writes, uh, I'm a lay person, so I'm wondering why when you get all turned around because of your inner ear, that's what we're talking about, um, you can't just flip on the autopilot and take over uh, while you regroup. Well, that's exactly what you should do. Uh, if you've got an autopilot, not every airplane has an autopilot, and that's part of the problem. So on my... Um, Long Easy, for instance, most Long Easies don't have an autopilot. I've got an autopilot on mine, but it's an add-on after the fact. A lot of Cessnas and so forth don't have autopilots on them. They're just hand-flown airplanes. But if you got one, it's your best friend. Turn that autopilot on. It might save your life. Okay, Mark 71158. Captain Steve, how long did it take for you to be able to fly comfortably uh, by instruments only? They, you know, the Navy launches you into that almost right away. 
So my first 12 hours in the airplane were all what we'd call VFR flying. Uh, there wasn't a lot of instrument training. They want to train you how to take the airplane off, how to land the airplane, how to configure it. If you've got an engine loss, how to look for a place to land. They train you on those things. And basically, it's got to be a clear day and you can fly from point A to point B. That's what they teach you. If the weather comes in, if, uh, all they taught me in those early days was how to follow a VOR needle to a VOR, and that wasn't a lot of training. Now, uh, over the years now, and after that, shortly after I soloed, then we started my instrument training, and that lasted for probably another, I don't know, six to seven months of training. It was about eight to nine altogether before you uh, get finished and you earn your wings. The instrument training you get in the military is the most extensive on the planet. The last check ride I took in what's called a T-44, which is a Beechcraft King Air, uh, was the most comprehensive check ride I've ever had in an actual airplane. Uh, it's designed to overwhelm you. Uh, and if you can bear up under everything that they throw at you on that last flight, you have earned your wings. And so every naval aviator, every Air Force pilot that's gone through that final check ride, they have absolutely earned their wings. That's a great question. All right, I've got uh, DW hit fifty three thirty four. Uh, have you and one of your first officers ever become suddenly physically ill or incapacitated at the same time during flight? And if so, how did you manage that situation? Um, I've never had both of us become what you would call incapacitated. Now, I've read about flights where pilots have become incapacitated. You've probably seen some on this channel where I did commentary on a pilot that became incapacitated. Uh, I did get sick one time on an airplane, uh, and it was because of the food. I, I got food poisoning. I managed to make it all the way to my destination. You know what? If you've had food poisoning, you know what I'm talking about. You start to feel kind of funny. You Something's wrong in your stomach. Maybe you get a little sweat. Uh, and you're, you're, you're wondering, am I getting the flu? Am I getting sick? Was it something I ate, right? But it takes a while. So it took about four hours for all that to develop. We landed at the airport. We, we taxied to the gate. I was feeling progressively worse as we were taxiing to the gate. Once we set the parking brake, I don't know if it was psychological, but as soon as I set that parking brake, I was like, oh my word, I got to run for the bathroom. And I did. Uh, now, should I have handed it over to my co-pilot? Yeah, in retrospect, you could argue I, I probably should have. I didn't feel bad enough until that moment where we finally just parked the airplane. So uh, again, those are all learning experiences for us, but I've never been in a situation where we both got incapacitated. Uh, Molly Gog writes, I would love a conversation between you and Zyla Foxlin about mental health and pilots. Um, she had her license revoked for seeking mental health treatment and she's become vocal about it. Uh, I'm familiar with Zyla's... Uh, Stuff. I mean, she does videos and so forth, uh, and I would enjoy a conversation with her if she ever wants to be on a future episode of uh, Hangar Flying. Uh, we would like to have her, Zyla, reach out if you're listening to this uh, and let us know, uh, and maybe we can put something up. Uh, there is a, a stigma around a pilot's self-reporting. Uh, and that's one of the conversations that we've opened up on this channel. We think it's important that we get rid of that stigma. It takes a long time to change a culture. And the FAA, in a lot of ways, is way behind the power curve on is issues like this and other issues where they need to be more progressive in terms of saying, hey, look, if there's good treatments in place, if somebody's dealing with depression, there's no reason that they should keep that to themselves. They should be able to tell their, their FAA medical examiner that they're dealing with depression without any fear of losing their livelihood or their license. There's great treatments for it uh, where you can continue to fly and be just fine, all right? So yeah, I'd love to have that conversation. That's a good question. All right, I've got Mike with a bunch of letters and numbers behind his name. I'm a physician assistant and have always been curious what happens during a medical emergency uh, from the responders side, if there is there an FAA physician on the ground in charge and is the equipment standardized? So every airplane I fly at my airline has what's called a grab and go medical kit. And in that grab and go kit, there's a everything. I've talked to doctors, physicians that said it's really got everything in it uh, that you could possibly imagine that you could want in maybe a makeshift emergency room. Uh, and so that if there's a physician on board the airplane, they've got the equipment there uh, that we carry it along with us. Uh, now, from their perspective, you know, they're trained in this sort of thing. The best person to have on an airplane is probably, I mean, a physician is good, 
a physician's assistant is good, but probably an EMT, somebody who's trained in that first responder trauma, because uh, that's really what takes place on the airplane. Um, and then you get them down on the ground into a hospital and they can see a physician. But that's a that's a very, very good question. All right, next is Ed Rupp 2318. Could flying a commercial airliner into a severe thunderstorm cause the aircraft to break apart? Or do pilots avoid them mainly because it would be uncomfortable for passengers? We never, ever, ever, ever fly into a thunderstorm. You have to avoid a thunderstorm by 25 miles away. Uh, and yes, you could do severe damage to an airplane if you flew it into a thunderstorm. I don't, I mean, there's been some incidents where people have thrown, flown through hail and some bad storms. It wasn't on purpose. It was by mistake. Uh, the airplane stayed together, but severe damage to the airplane for sure. You don't want to fly through a thunderstorm. You just don't. Okay, I've got, uh, let me see, Thomas uh, Gatchi, 8158. I'm a former... Uh, aerographer's mate. Not really sure what that is. I'd like to hear that in the comments. An aerographer's mate. Uh, have you ever flown a plane that was struck by lightning? Not me personally, but I've flown with a bunch of guys who have. Uh, I've been in situations where I probably should have gotten struck by lightning. We were uh, in kind of awful weather and there was lightning all around, but uh, fortunately I never got hit by lightning. The airplanes are designed to take a lightning strike and to dissipate the electricity off the airplane. There's a thing called static wicks off the ends of each of the wings and off the back of the tail of the airplane, and they dissipate any electrical, uh, the electricity that hits the airplane um, from a lightning strike. So um, the airplane will fly just fine afterwards. All right, uh, ILL4Q2 says, when you have a divert, Due to a medical emergency or an unruly passenger, which might be two different things, who is responsible for all the added costs? Does the airline eat it or is the passenger liable? That's a really good question. Um, I have heard in some cases that the passengers have been sent a bill. Now, certainly not for medical emergencies, but for unruly passengers. I think it would depend on the level of unruly. Uh, certainly anything that you do in a commercial airliner is a felony. It's a federal offense. So that gets you into a whole higher category uh, than a misdemeanor or a state offense. Uh, and again, I, I have heard of uh, passengers being hit with fines and imprisoned for a bad behavior on an airplane. So again, my friends, think twice about your behavior on an airplane and think twice about drinking alcohol and taking Ambien. It's a bad combination on an airplane. All right, I've got PQRS underscore 987. What happens when you're uh, piloting a private aircraft and due to an emergency, the best option is a military airfield. Does civilian ATC call the base and say, hide your secrets incoming? <laughs> no, they don't. They don't keep the secrets out <laughs> on the counter in operations or in the airport. Um, have uh, commercial airliners had to land in an emergency at military airports? Yes. Um, and in fact, I have landed in military airports before, uh, but it was part of a scheduled operation. So again, there's no secrets out and so forth that you're going to find out by landing there. But if it's a runway and you're in an emergency and you need to get your airplane down, do what you need to do. All right, uh, AOOA926 writes, have you ever had to squawk 7700 emergency or 7600 lost comms? If so, what was the situation? Yes, I've had to do both of those and it was the same situation. So I was flying my Beechcraft King Air as an instructor training students. We had a total comm failure where I couldn't hear anybody. And so I squawked 7,700 for about 60 seconds. And then I got rid of that and I turned it over to 7,600. If you keep it on 7,700, it continues to squawk and it just clobbers everybody's screen that's looking at you. They want you to just do that for a minute. If they can make communication with you, they will. They'll tell you to turn it off. But if it's lost common, they can't then just go to 7,600 on your own, which I did. And then you broadcast in the blind. It, it turned out that everybody could hear me, but I couldn't hear anybody. So it, it had a good outcome. We landed safely. Uh, Professor Zombie 12, what is the most serious civilian flight emergency you've ever encountered in real life? I would say uh, the worst was back in the Navy days again. 
it's a it's a combination between two. One was we we um, landed on a wet runway in a bad storm, and the airplane began to hydroplane, and we almost went off the end of the runway. The other is back in King Airs when I was training students, we had an, uh, basically a rudder got stuck all the way out as we rotated off the runway. The airplane yawed violently. We almost got into what's called a an approach turn stall or a skidded turn stall where the downwind wing that's being blocked by the fuselage loses lift. And in which case it becomes like a Coke machine that's attached to your airplane. It's not providing any lift and it's just a heavy hunk of metal. Uh, at 20 feet off the ground, the airplane would flip on its back and you would go into the ground. Um, that happened. Uh, we were, I was able to overcome that um, by asymmetrical power and, and a couple of other things. But uh, that's probably the scariest moments moments I've had in an airplane over the years. Nothing in, in, in my airline career uh, gets even close to either one of those. All right, where's my keys at? That's a, that's a great name. What are the best words of wisdom or the most valuable piece of advice that you've received uh, in your aviation career? Here's number one at the top of my list. Don't let somebody outside your cockpit try to fly your airplane for you. That's it. The other bit of advice is listen up on the radios, keep your head on a swivel, have fun. I got that right from day one, but later on, uh, several pilots said, don't ever let somebody outside your cockpit try to fly your airplane for you. That's great advice. And so for all my experienced pilots out there, there you go. There's your gym for the day. Final question. Uh, Don uh, Riker, 6093, in all of your years flying for both the Navy and the airlines, have you ever seen anything in the sky that you can't explain? No, I haven't. I've talked to other guys that have. Um, there's When you go up in the Northeast, when you're, you're flying up the East Coast of the U.S., into Canadian airspace, as you start your North Atlantic crossing, uh, there's a whole series of kind of lights up in, in the skies, in the heavens, if you will, uh, that kind of glow and then they go out and they glow and they go out. And sometimes there's a whole line of them. And what I've understood those to be is that the the North Star, is that what it's called? The, the communication satellites that Elon Musk has set up out there. And as they as the sun, which might not be it might be on the other side of the earth, hits those things. Sometimes they light up and sometimes they disappear. It looks a little creepy at times, like maybe it's a UFO. But my answer to people that ask the UFO question, have you ever seen a UFO? My answer is simple, not from the outside. Well, that's it today for Ask the Captain. Keep those great questions coming. And I maybe, maybe, just maybe, you make it on the next episode of Ask the Captain. I'm Captain Steve.